Hello, good evening. Om Shanti. Welcome to the Meditation Museum. We have a very special guest tonight, um, Dr. Ben Michaelis from New York. He is a clinical psychologist in full-time practice in uh, Manhattan. Dr. Michaelis writes and speaks regularly about mental health, creativity, and spirituality. He is the author of numerous popular and scholarly articles and is a regular contributor to the Huffington Post. Dr. Michaelis is a frequent guest on nationally syndicated TV shows such as NBC's The Today Show, the Hallmark Channel's Home and Family, and MSNBC's Your Business. In addition, Dr. Michaelis also has his latest book with us today. It's called Your Next Big Thing, and we have copies in the back. So with that, I want to welcome Dr. Ben. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and thanks to all of you for, for coming and being here and lending your time and presence to this. Uh, it really is becoming increasingly rare when we get a chance to all sort of be together in one place in, in every way. And so I really am grateful to all of you for, for taking the time and coming here. Um, all of my writing and, uh, and, and speaking really comes out of my work as a clinician. I've been uh, a clinical psychologist in private practice for about the last 10 years. And I work with a fairly diverse uh, clientele. And one thing, and it's just one of the really lovely things is just looking around the room, the, the, the lovely diversity that I see here in this room, uh, which is just, it's just wonderful to experience that. And because many of us, you know, we may look different or we may be of different genders or different ages, but we really are fundamentally walking the same journey in our lives. And uh, a lot of the themes that I'll be talking about tonight, uh, presence and purpose and process, these sort of universal ideas that affect many of us in different ways. And so some of these ideas may, may touch you where you are tonight, and some of them might not. But they are sort of universal ideas that I have derived from being a clinician and with that, I think it's actually a good, a good opportunity to talk a little bit about expectations because I think that in many ways, life really comes down to expectations. Uh, if you set your expectations really high, you're likely to be disappointed. And if your expectations are pretty low, you could actually find yourself uh, really happy about something that's actually mediocre or even lousy. So uh, from the outset, I just want to let you know what it is that you can expect from tonight. And I want to let you know that I'm really going to break it down for you in two words of what you can expect from this evening, which is absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to expect that you're going to get absolutely nothing out of this time that we spend together. You're not going to be entertained. You're not going to learn anything. Uh, in fact, you might even forget things uh, along the way. So you can kind of think of this as the high point of the evening, and the rest of it is going to be downhill from here. And that way, if you don't expect anything, and you do get something out of it, you can kind of consider it a bonus. And if you don't expect anything, and it really is quite a lousy experience, well, at least I warned you in advance. <laughs> so that, we've got that going for us. So, but seriously, I really am hoping that you'll come out of this experience thinking a little bit differently about your own journeys and your own lives. And it's not just thinking that I'm hoping uh, that'll happen here, but. I, my goal is actually to move people towards some form of action. Uh, because fundamentally, talk is cheap. Um, maybe not my talk, <laughs> because I get paid by the hour. But generally speaking, talk is quite cheap. And I tell people when they come into my office that if I'm not moving them towards some tangible action, then I'm probably wasting their time. And so my hope is that you're going to leave here maybe with a little bit more wisdom, but also a, a lot more fire in, in your belly towards doing something towards taking action on your next big thing. Um, and that will, for me, feel like uh, a great deal of success. And so um, I thought that maybe um, 
I'll talk a little bit about how the evening's gonna go. When clients come in to meet with me, they usually come in when they're feeling stuck in one way or another in their lives. Either they are having difficulties with a primary relationship, or they're having difficulties with a job, or they're having trouble with the way they relate to the world. And so I think of them, in many ways, as starting out from a place of running in place. And over the process, I'm trying to help them get towards moving with purpose. So that's really sort of the course of the, 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 the therapy. And in doing that, there's really three things that I try to, to, to give them along the way to help to move them from running in place to moving with purpose. And I'm going to not block the screen and show you what those things are. And I call these the, the three P's of your next big thing. And they are presence, purpose, and process. And those three things are going to guide the course of our talk this evening. So without further ado, you probably want me to sit down a bit, uh, realizing. So I will do that. But it's going to be very hard for me because I just like to walk around. So you'll be able to follow me if I do that? OK, yeah. well, we'll see. We'll, we'll move it up a little bit here and there. Um, so we're going to start by talking about a concept, which is presence. Presence is one of those things, those words that's sort of out there in the ether. And we may not know exactly what, what it means. But the way I define presence is that wherever you are physically, you're also there mentally and emotionally. You're completely aligned. And I've come to think of presence as, as, as really, in some ways, a hallmark of well-being. Uh, um, when, and one of the reasons that I, I think it's critical for getting to your next big thing is it's, it's hard to make change in life. It's just hard enough when you're moving against the tide, but it's, it's much harder if you're not all there, if you're not all fundamentally together. So helping people sort of get to a sense of presence is, is a key part of my practice. And there was this, uh, there was this video that, um, you'll, hopefully you'll, you'll indulge me, that was uh, out uh, maybe in the fall that was on late night TV with Louis C.K. and Conan O'Brien. And he was talking about, he, Louis C.K. was on this rant about technology and cell phones. And this, this little clip went viral after, the, after this show. And I thought that what Louis C.K. was in some ways was talking about was presence. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to show you just a couple of minutes of it, because I thought it was quite interesting. And I think this is the reason that it actually went viral, not because people necessarily hate their cell phones, but because he was actually tapping into something that people are really um, wanting to experience. So forgive me for a moment. I'm going to jigger with the, uh... oh, sorry. kids face scrunch up and they go "Ooh, that doesn't feel good to make a person do that right. but they but they gotta start with doing the mean thing but when they write you're fat then they just go mmm I mean, that was fun i like that. <laughs> <laughs> that tasted good yeah exactly you need the thing is i you need to build an ability to just be yourself and not be mm -hmm. doing something that's what the yes. phones are taking away yes is the ability to just sit there, like this. That's being a person, right? Yes. No one can, they gotta, uh, you gotta check. Because, they, you know, underneath everything in your life, there's that thing, that empty, forever empty. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, I, yes. Yes, just I know. Just that you're they acknowledge about. that it's all for nothing and you're alone. You know, it's still there. <laughs> And sometimes when things clear away, you're not watching it, you're in your car, and you start going, oh, no, here it comes, <laughs> that I'm alone, like it starts to visit on you. You know, just the sadness. Yes. Life is tremendously sad just by, you know, being in it. And so you're driving, and then you go, uh, that's why we text and drive. I look around, pretty much 100% of people driving are texting. Yes. And they're killing, everybody's murdering each other with their cars. Yes. But people are willing to risk taking a life and ruining their own 
because they don't want to be alone for a second because it's so hard. I was in my car. Okay. That's, that's the, the idea. Then he goes and talks about Bruce Springsteen for a while. Um, so, okay. Okay. So that, thank you, Louis C.K. Uh, he did a much more entertaining job of explaining it than I possibly could have. But this idea of, of being present is, is so critical, and yet most of us spend a lot of our time being absent from where we are. And so I wanted to talk about really the two reasons that I think that a lot of us spend a lot of, of our time being absent rather than present. And there, these two reasons are one is being overwhelmed, and the second one is being in pain. So I'm going to talk about each of these for a moment. All of us, everyone in this room, everyone in our society, comes into contact with an excessive amount of information, more information than we can possibly, than we truly can process. And there's lots of data about how much information we come into contact with versus how much data we process, information we process. And it's just so overwhelming that we just, we want to escape and we leave that, 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 that present being there. And I think especially in places, in cities, I'm from New York, here in DC, we're just, the, the amount of information that we're bombarded with and the amount of people that we see. In, in the prehistoric environment, we came into a contact with no more than 150 people. That was what a, a, really a tribe or a village was, 150 people. I come into co contact with 150 people on my subway car going to work. And it's just, it's too much. And I think that part of the, you know, I've, I've been lecturing in different places in the country and you know, there's an idea that New Yorkers are really rude or hostile, and, and maybe it's true, uh, I'm not, but, <laughs> no, but, but I think it's really just that we're so overwhelmed by the amount of information that we just kind of close down and we're not friendly. Like when I'm in you know, Oklahoma or Arizona, people are just like, hi, how are you? And we can't do that in cities, it's just too much. And so, so the, the first reason that a lot of us escape is just feeling overwhelmed. The second one is this idea about pain, and this is the one that I see a lot in my practice uh, as a clinician. And I mean, if you think about it for a moment, this idea of being of pain, right? The way we're wired as human beings, when we experience pain, so let's say you touch, let's say I were to touch that bulb right now, I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna demonstrate, but if I were to touch that bulb right now, immediately I would recoil, my hand would move away. And that's a natural reaction. It's, it doesn't even go up to your brain, it's a spinal cord reaction. Uh, and the reason for that is so that we would survive. So thankfully, we have that reaction uh, in the physical world. And the same idea works in the psychological world. When we're in pain, we want to escape uh, that, that sense of pain that we're experiencing, but there's nowhere to go. So we do the sort of the next best thing, which is we, we leave the moment, we escape. And when we leave, there's really um, two places that we can go, three places that we can go rather, which is we can go to the past, we can go to the future, or we can go elsewhere. And I'll talk about each of these in turn because they, they, each, they each have different implications. So people that tend to be anchored to the past, in, in my practice I see that are, people that are usually depressed tend to be somewhat more anchored to the past their thoughts, their pattern of thoughts are focused on things that happened, ruminating over the past, mentally trying to undo things that have happened, or pining for the good old de days and sort of wishing for them to return. And that is in very, very much the sort of the thought pattern of depression. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's really seductive because we sort of play this, this game, this script over and over in our minds, but the past is the past. I mean, that doesn't exist anymore. That snap that I just did, it's in the past. And we, we can easily forget that because our mind is sort of trying to redo or undo experiences that we've had. So that's depression. People that are focused on the future are more anxious. And I actually believe that the literature will bear me out hopefully for this. And some, I think that depression and anxiety are the exact same thing. They're just mirror images of each other. And in fact, that when we're anxious, our mind tries to sort of project us into the future. It acts like it's working on something. Uh, it's, it's planning for something. But it's not really planning. See, that's the thing. The thing about the sort of seductive 
insidi insidious nature of anxiety is that you're sort of fooled into thinking that, oh, I'm planning for this thing to happen, but you're not, you're not really planning for it to happen because the thing that's missing is the moment. I'm sure that many of you can think back to your own experiences when you were worried about something, an experience that you were going to have, and then when you actually got into the moment, you actually had more energy and more sort of oomph than you realized you possibly could have because you were actually there in the moment. And there's something really magical about that. But when we're anxious, we're not really doing that. We're spinning. I sort of liken it to like, you know, when, you're, uh, for, you know, when your computer is trying to run a program and it's just like spinning, but it's not, it's not opening any windows or anything like that? Uh, not that that's ever happened to me, but I'm sure. Uh, but it's like, it's this idea that it's spinning over and over again. When I was in graduate school, I, I worked with this woman um, who was very anxious about traveling and flying in particular. And uh, she started dating this man from Europe. And uh, so we were coming up to spring break, and she was going to have to go to Europe to visit his family, to meet his family. And she was getting really, really anxious. And it was like I could literally graph the anxiety as we were getting closer and closer to spring break. And she was getting more and more nervous. And so she started running through these different scenarios about what could happen on the trip, what could go wrong on the trip. And um, what ended up happening was they got into a fender bender on the way to the airport. They were totally fine. But she hadn't come up with that solution. She'd come up with every other possibility but that one. And in our work together, I began referring to that as the thousandth and first scenario. It's always the one that you haven't thought up. Is the one, that's the one that happens. And the only way to sort of win is to not play because when it's, none of them are, are real. And I'm going to come back to this idea in just a, just a moment when I, after I talk about elsewhere. So you can go to the past, you can go to the future, or you can go elsewhere. And elsewhere is basically anything else. Uh, when you're thinking about people, places, or things that are not in your immediate environment, or you are distracting yourself using um, the internet, or television, or alcohol or drugs or anything like that that's keeping you outside of the present, outside of where you are. And, and there's, I want to be clear that there's nothing wrong with thinking about the past in order to learn from it or actually sitting down and planning for the future or having, you know, escaping. Um, I mean, I watched the entire House of Cards. I saw every episode. So there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, at least I hope not. Uh, and, uh, but it's the, the key element is choice, that you're choosing to do it as opposed to it becoming sort of a habit that your mind automatically moves you into these, into these three different spaces. So if you find yourself moving into one of these three different spaces regularly, it's worth taking a look and saying, okay, something is, something is wrong. Why am I not able to be right here, right now? And so I think that the idea of getting to your next big thing, to, to, to making positive change in your life, you really do need to cultivate a sense of presence, of being where you are. And you can always tell, I think, when someone's not with you. You know, they're just, they're just in a little bit, oh, they're not there. But, but, and when someone is, you can also tell that as well. You can, I think you can usually feel it. We're, we're much more attuned to each other's energy than we may be, certainly than we're conscious of. Um, we process so much more information when we're with someone uh, and we're actually together. Uh, I, I actually very, very rarely do I allow to do phone sessions or Skype sessions. I just, it's not the way we're meant to interact with one another. Um, and so this idea of cultivating a sense of presence is, is critical. And there's lots of different ways to do it. I mean, we're here at the meditation center. Meditation is a fantastic way to do it, but it's not the only way to do it. Prayer is another way. And in fact, there's great literature showing the consistency between prayer and meditation and what happens neuropsychologically. Uh, I re re read this article recently from Italy showing people doing the rosary and people doing um, mantra meditation and th their brain scans are like identical. It's, it's quite amazing. It's really the same processes that we're doing of cultivating that sense of presence. Uh, and, and there's other ways to do it as well. One of the things that I thought I might uh, do with you here, if you'll indulge me, is one of the exercises that I have in my book, which is a way to kind of try to break some of these patterns of thinking to bring you into the moment. And so what I thought I would do is sort of walk you through it 
and then explain it afterwards if you're, if you're game. So if you're not game, you can just play on your iPhone. I won't even notice. Um, <laughs> I hear they're bringing back, what's that, that thing with, not Angry Bird, Flappy Bird, yes. I hear they're bringing that back. So feel free to download it. I won't even notice. Um, so you're welcome to uh, uh, close your eyes, but you do not have to. If it's not, not comfortable, please don't, actually. Um, and we're going to run through this exercise that I use for people in my practice and that I, I recommend for folks when they're feeling like they're sort of spiraling. So the first thing that I want you to do is, is focus your energy, your mental energy, on your olfactory sense, on your sense of smell. What are you smelling right now? Smelling some cream or sweat or your hair or the person next to you or your clothing, things that you were not conscious of just, just a moment ago before I mentioned these things. And then gradually take your sense, uh, your energy away from that and start to focus a little bit on your auditory sense. What are you hearing? You may not have been conscious of the uh, air conditioning or the rustling of a neighbor before just a couple of seconds ago. And then you can move into the gustatory sense your sense of taste. What is it that you taste in your mouth? Was it the burrito that you wolfed down on the way over here? Or the coffee? Or is there a metallic taste in your mouth? Next, move your mental energy to your your sense of touch. What are you touching? Were you just a second ago not thinking about the weight of, of the backs of your legs against your chair or where the chair is hitting, hitting your back or the way your hands feel resting on one another or one leg leaning on the other? And finally, if you're comfortable or if you've been closing your eyes, open your eyes. And focus on the visual sense, what you're taking in right now. You're taking in me, maybe, if you're looking at me, or Flappy Bird, if you're doing that, or anything else, your neighbors, people that are in front of you. One of the reasons that I use this as a, as a it's, it's, not an, it's not an actual meditation, but it is a way of checking in with your senses. It, what it does is it, it immediately breaks you, especially if you're spiraling on those thoughts of anxiety or depression. Because, and the reason, and if you're going to do, if you're going to try this at home, uh, always start with the olfactory sense. The olfactory sense is our most primitive sense. Uh, it is our most powerful sense. It's the only sense uh, that we have that does not go into the thalamus, which is the, like a way station in our minds, and it goes directly to the limbic system where it's processed, um, which is why it's so powerful. It, it sort of the way it's uh, the way it's wired. It's basically in the limbic system with um, memory and basic emotions and smell are all sort of jumbled in the, basically the same area, which is why when you like suddenly catch a whiff of like a a bakery, you're you're like transported right back to your grandmother's house or whatever it is from when you're four years old because they're wired in the exact same place in your mind. It's not an accident, but the reason I always start with it is because it's just so powerful and it will stop you instantly. You can't be spiraling on thoughts of anxiety or depression while you're focused on the senses. It's not possible. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to also dispel another myth, which is there's no such thing as multitasking. It doesn't really <laughs> exist. Um, you can't, it's not possible to do. You can switch back and forth between tasks extremely rapidly, but you cannot do two things cognitively at the same time, or if you, when you try to, you end up doing both of them really, really poorly. Um, there's, so, but it, this, is, this is one of those cases where if you focus on this, it will stop you. And, and I, I, I do like this because it's a very practical thing that you can do during the day. 
um, if you're feeling anxious uh, before before giving a talk, for example, you could do that. Uh, but it's one of these things that you can use. It's a very practical um, approach, which I really try to make my work to be very practical. Uh, I don't, I'm not really one that really likes to, to, to read things that are so impractical, um, because otherwise, like, what's the use of it? Um, so I, I try to make these things fairly practical for you, uh, for people. Um, so. But again, you can use these things. The purpose of them is just to stop you from spiraling and bring you into the present. Um, speaking of purpose, uh, we're going to go into talking about purpose. So this concept of purpose is central to I think, all of our lives and certainly central to my, my writing and what I talk about a lot. The idea of purpose, I think, is really about um, living a life for something that's larger than yourself. And it's not just about, it's not theory. It's about values and action. And what's important to you and how you're taking action on what's important to you. It's sort of at the nexus of values and action is this concept of purpose. And our values change throughout our lives as we go on and we have different experiences. Values are dynamic. And in fact, one thing I do want to encourage all of you to do is to challenge your values. There's, there's an abundant research that as we move into our 30s and we really start to lose, we really start to lose our hearing, because uh, that's really when it starts. So it starts at 25 and then like after 30, our hearing starts to really go. Uh, but the other thing that happens around 30 is that our tastes in um, important things uh, become ossified. They really harden up. There's usually not a lot of change uh, in terms of taste in music and um, political beliefs. All these sorts of things tend to ossify in our 30s. Um, and I, I would encourage all of you to like, and we also tend to be less likely to befriend people that have different values than us uh, or different beliefs than us, certainly in our 30s. So I encourage all of you to spend time talking to people that think differently than you do. It's incredibly valuable to do that, and we don't do it. None of us. I, I live in New York. I think of New York as like the most like, small towny, like everyone kind of thinks the same way. And it's, it's hard to get out of that way of thinking. But I think it's really important because I think that it also keeps you kind of young and vibrant when your, your beliefs and your ideas are challenged. As it so happens, I've spent a lot of time in the last uh, couple of years in Oklahoma. And it's been really wonderful for me to, to spend a lot of time around people that are really somewhat, you know, come from different places than I do. Uh, because I think that's when you get to learn and you get to appreciate things. Um, I was at uh, this, these, this guy that I met. Uh, he and his wife invited me over for dinner uh, when I was out there in November. And uh, we were about to sit and eat. and uh, they grabbed hands and they prayed. And he said a pretty, um, pretty intense prayer. And uh, then we, we ate. And this is not something that happens a lot in Manhattan, I can tell you that. When you're invited to people's houses, there's not a lot of prayer uh, that tends to happen. And uh, so I mentioned it to him. I said, look, you know, Ken, I was like, I just wanted to say thank you so much for, for doing that. Uh, I really appreciated it. And he was like, wow. I, he was like, I was hesitant to do it. Uh, you know, we always do it. It's our family custom, but I didn't know how it was going to read with you. Um, when we have guests from out of town, I'm always hesitant, but it's our custom, and so we do it. And I will tell you that that meal, I was more conscious of the meal, of enjoying the food, of enjoying the company, than I had been in many other social settings. That just taking the time to be grateful for the food and the company was such a wonderful experience. And and I tend to eat quickly, which is something I need to work on. But I ate so slowly during that meal, and I really savored every bite. And I'm certain it's because he, he focused us at the beginning of the meal. It was a really useful thing. And it's probably an experience I might not have had had I been having dinner with people in, in Manhattan. Um, so uh, it's a good idea to, to challenge your values in life, I think, and to, to spend time with different people. Um, and so. This, this idea that values change, I, I encourage people to consider what your values are 
um, a certainly a couple of times a year. Uh, I, like when you change the clocks as we just did, like check in with yourself. Think what's important to you now. A lot of times when I have young folks come into my office, especially like right out of college, there's this, there's, there's an existential angst that tends to come along with them. Like, what am I going to do with my life? And I always say, like, that is an impossible question to answer. So don't even ask it. What you can do is add two words to that question, and it becomes an infinitely more useful question, which is, what am I going to do with my life for now? That's a manageable question. That you can answer. But you can't answer the question, what am I going to do with my life? Because you're going to be changing throughout your life. There's no way to answer it. It's, it's overwhelming. And I say the same thing about values, like, what are my values for now? And you live your values by what you spend your time doing. And that's, that's because values are, you know, purpose, which is the intersection of values and action, it's really about what are you doing with your actions. And so I have a, I just had a little list here, which uh, you can look at. But these are just uh, values that some people had, had listed during using some of the exercises from the book. Um, and what I, I have a couple of other exercises that I use, um, and I'm going to, they're, they're sort of thought exercises that I use, and they're, uh, they use them in my practice, they're from the book. But these are just ideas to kind of get you thinking about the concept of purpose. And so if you're willing to indulge me again, you can keep your eyes open, keep them closed, but I'm going to ask you to kind of think through some of these questions about your, the concept of purpose. And again, this is just for now, rather than for five years from now. So here are some thought exercises. If you were wealthy beyond reason, you did not need to work another day in your life, how would you spend your time? How would you spend those hours that you may spend right now at a job? If you could make one lasting change in the world that was guaranteed to affect people after you're gone, what would you do? If you could create something, if you could create an organization that would change the world in some way, what kind of organization would you make? Would it make the world more fun, healthier, happier? If you could create a Super Bowl ad, a 60 second spot where you could tell the world anything you wanted, what would that ad look like? Would it be funny? Would it be sweet? Would it be poignant? And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through one more thought exercise, and then I'm going to tell you the story of how that thought exercise came to be. So I don't need to tell you to close your eyes. Well, some of you. but uh, And I want you to try to take up a mental picture of your great-great-granddaughter. Think about what your great-great-granddaughter is like. Think about who she hangs out with. Think about where she goes to school, what she has for breakfast. Think about what her daily life is like. Really put yourself in her shoes. And now turn the camera back on yourself and think about what your great-great-granddaughter knows about you. What did you do to contribute to her life, besides make her on some level? But did you leave her a recipe? Did you leave her a home? Did you leave her a poem? So this thought exercise is one that actually sort of changed my life. Not sort of, it did. So a number of years ago, 
uh, I was working with this woman who was feeling very stuck in her life and all of my techniques as a therapist were really just not working and I wasn't able to get any motion it was just nothing was happening and um, it was frustrating to be honest with you and uh, so I just kind of threw everything out and I just kind of came up with this uh, with her and uh, what she came up with was she said she would make a piece of jewelry for her great great granddaughter to wear to her senior prom and it f for this woman and honestly for me it, it was a life-changing event because she began making jewelry from that time forward and um, I don't know if you know this uh, Etsy.com that website so she was very involved with that with them very like a long time ago now and um, this changed her and for me as a clinician it began to change me and the way I thought about my work and got me thinking about concepts like creativity and play and how important they are in our lives because we tend to jettison those ideas as we get older and yet creativity I have come to think and it, the, the talk tonight is not so much about that but it really is a mental health issue um, if we're not creating uh, um, there's a part of us that's really dying fundamentally and this natural tendency so I'm not gonna go off on this much of a tangent about this I promise uh, but a little bit play the concept of play play is something that exists in every society ever studied it's something that children naturally do it's a way of problem solving it's a way of, of, of working through what's coming up and if you you spend time with children you'll just see them naturally play kids have different ways of playing but anyway this experience led me to I started writing down techniques that were working with her and that became the basis for the book um, and so there's her story was very much like followed throughout the, the book um, and um, so it also l led me to the next concept which is this idea about a statement of purpose and this is something that I encourage people to do a couple of times a year if you can again you can do it when you uh, change the clocks or change the batteries in your uh, smoke detectors but writing down how you want to spend your time and energy it's a really it, I think it can be a really focusing event uh, and it's not like a statement of purpose for any of you who've applied to like programs or college or anything like that where you're like just trying to figure out ways to market yourself to like the admissions officers like this is nothing to do with that this is about you and what matters to you and so you take take in what your values are you write them down and you think well right now what values do I want to live how do I want to spend my time for the next six months and how do I want to put my energy out in the world and one of the nice things about doing it about committing things like this to paper is it it really does help to kind of honor what is important to you and it, and it honors who you are fundamentally because if you're taking the time to write these things down it says that there's something important inside of you and it, 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 it it really is a document that can help guide your process and so I, what I when I recommend people do a statement of purpose it's it's actually pretty I'm gonna walk now so uh, it's actually pretty straightforward um, it's really three things which is your name um, one to two things th things that you believe in your values I believe X and one to two three one to three sentences of concrete actions of things that you're going to do of how you're going to live those values and it's it's here's the kicker it should be no more than a hundred words uh, it's not a college essay it's just something that is supposed to be guiding you into action and I'm not going to do this now but um, one thing that I encourage people to do is to like to, ch to check on each other to make sure that you're following through on these things because life gets in the way uh, and if you have someone that's sort of with you, uh, it's a really, it can be a really helpful technique. Guilt is a great motivator. Uh, so the, uh, the last thing that we're going to talk about this evening is this concept of process. And this is going to sort of close out the talk. We live in a very results-oriented society and especially from the way we are uh, train, we're trained in school to focus on grades and how are you doing and did you get the A and all of this and 
it's, 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 a, it's a problem. Um, it's why there's like all these cheating epidemics and things of that nature. Um, and I'm very interested in school reform. Um, but it's, it's, I don't think it's about you know, how you do on any given assignment or whatever. It's about what comes next and what you do with the choices that you make afterwards. And so a process approach to life is, is an approach to life where you think of yourself as unfinished and constantly changing and adapting. And that is a process-oriented approach. And I, I really am constantly encouraging this for people because once you have an idea of something that's important to you, something you want to do, things come up. Life gets in the way. And how, how do you adapt when things don't go as planned? Because they never do go as you plan them to. So the, the, uh, the ideas that I'm about to talk about are really ways of sort of trying to make your thought processes more process-oriented as opposed to uh, results-oriented, necessarily. Um, because I think that everyone in this room, everyone in this world really is a natural-born optimist. Uh, because if you think about it for a minute, the, we all have this, this instinct for self-preservation, every single one of us. And that's fundamentally an optimistic uh, instinct, right? It suggests that there's going to be a future, and we want to be a part of that future. That's a naturally optimistic way of, it's just in our DNA. But somewhere along the lines, when things don't work out, we tend to think, oh, I'm not this, or I'm not that, or I can't. And if you can adopt a more process-oriented approach to life, you're able to sort of see that when you hit a bend in the road, it's not the end of the road. And it's just a way, OK, how am I going to adapt to this? Because when things don't go your way, that's a good thing. It means it's, it's a chance for you to adapt and, and do something different and learn. And when we, if we can take that approach to sort of towards everything in life, it's not really about whether you win or learn, it's, lose. It's about whether you win or learn. And so a couple of things that I suggest uh, doing for, to have more of a process-oriented approach to life the first is to celebrate your victories. And this is something that people forget to do all the time. In fact, people don't even, well, so I, I was working with this guy a number of years ago who uh, was, is a writer. And he uh, had finished a manuscript before he came into my office. I didn't know that at first. And he was working for an internet company where he was doing writing for the w website. And he was very, very nervous about the product of his work. He was always concerned that other people weren't gonna, were going to judge it really harshly. Um, but he had this boss who was pretty well connected in the publishing world. And he had mentioned offhandedly to his boss that he had a finished manuscript. And he knew that, like, he knew of my reputation that I wasn't going to, like, let that. Once he told me that, that I wasn't going to let that slide. And I was pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. And we were trying to figure out a way to get him to get his manuscript to his boss in a way that felt OK to him. And uh, I was not successful. And so I kind of dropped it. And for the next few weeks, we started focusing on some issues with his girlfriend. I totally had forgotten about it. And then he'd offhandedly mentioned that he'd given the manuscript to his boss. And he was like, I was like, whoa, whoa what? You gave, you gave the manuscript to your boss? And he said that, um, yeah, yeah, but he hadn't, he hadn't heard back from his boss. He was really worried. He figured that his boss thought it was lousy. And, and I was like, you don't get it. You've already won. See, the victory isn't what your boss thinks of your manuscript. The victory is you giving the manuscript to your boss. And that changed for him the way to think about victories. Because we can, we can all tend to mark victories, things that are obvious. But what, what's a victory for you it may not be the same as a victory for your neighbor. I once, when I was at, at, um, when I was at the hospital, I, I worked with a guy who, this, a victory for him was going to return a couple of pillows at Macy's. He was very socially anxious, and the idea that he would tell someone that he, these pillows were not good was really, really difficult, and it took a long time. And it was a real victory for him once he did that. Now, that might not be a victory for you, but it really was for him. And remembering that, you know, to, to, you know this woman who I'm working with now is a writer. She got 100 pages done on her manus manuscript. And I was like, you're going to celebrate. You're taking yourself out, and you're going to celebrate. Because she'd never gotten that far in what she'd, been, she'd written. Um, and she did. She's up to 130 now. 
Uh, and so the idea of reminding yourself what are, I call those internal victories, things that like other people not, might not be able to notice, but that you can notice. Those are internal victories. And it's important to mark them as opposed to external victories. Those are things that are, people are, that are pretty obvious to people. And so that's one way of having a process-oriented approach to life. The other one is to make process interpretations. And this woman that I mentioned earlier, Amanda, who was uh, uh, a jeweler, um, we were, it was um, getting to be like close to Christmas, and there's a lot of like um, craft fairs that come to the city around Christmas time. And so she was trying to make uh, a lot of jewelry for this one crafts fair. And she was really sort of pushing herself. And so she had set a goal for herself to get seven pieces of jewelry done this one week to do like a piece a day. And uh, she didn't. She didn't get it done. And uh, she was despondent. Uh, she was really sad and like all those self-doubt, everything just sort of came in and, and you know, she's like, you know, all, you know what that, that inner critic is like and it was just being merciless and I, I said, look, you know, you could say that, you could say all those things that your inner critic says and that, you know, you're a failure and you're never going to do this, but from another, another approach, a process-oriented approach, you've done a lot. She was taking all these jewelers classes and she'd gotten all these tools and it was like, and she was making things. Um, and so, you know, we have this sort of voice, the inner critic, and so what I encourage people to do is like write down what your inner critic, how your inner critic would interpret this, and then what's the obvious action that would follow that interpretation. So her inner critic says you're a failure, you're never going to do it, and so the obvious action after that is to do nothing. No one wants to be criticized. But, you know, the, the inner hero, the other part of her, the, the optimistic part, would say like, hey, this is a, this is a process, and you got a couple pieces of jewelry done, you didn't get all seven done, but what can we do to change that? And all we changed was two, like two things, which were she decided to do the work before, uh, the jewelry before her work day because she would get so tired at the end of her work day she just didn't want to do it. Um, and we made the rule that she didn't actually have to produce a piece a day, that she can get seven pieces done, but she could do, th you know, if she was working on a Saturday or things like that, that it wasn't, we didn't have to have this hard and fast rule. She got 11 pieces of jewelry done the next week. And it's just from that change in interpretation and seeing things a little bit differently that your actions are guided. So it's, it's just, it's a different approach to thinking. It's a process-oriented approach to thinking. Okay, so we are going to wrap up uh, and talk about the three, wait a minute. The three P's of your neck. That's, I put that slide in there to see who's paying attention. So for those of you who, didn't, who missed it, everyone else, don't tell them. They just missed it. It just, it just is, OK? Um, so basically, the three things that we talked about tonight were, one, this concept of presence, of being where you are physically, mentally, emotionally, concept of purpose, of thinking about and acting on your values and what's, what matters to you. And finally, the concept of process, which is that you know, basically nobody walks a straight path in life, and it's about what you do with what happens and taking a, a more flexible approach towards things that happen to you. And so in a couple of minutes, we're going to stop. And um, what's, what's really cool is that this gathering it's never going to happen again. All these people, all of us that are here, we've sort of formed this micro community for just a little while. Like, it's never going to happen again. And there's something kind of neat about that. And I encourage all of you to like take a moment and look around at people. Uh, you know, we don't in our society we don't look at people a lot. We're like forbidden to do it. Uh, like I, it's uncomfortable, right? When I was, a number of years ago, I was in India, and I was there for a while, and I started to get used to looking at people, you know, and because people would look at me, here's this like tall, bald guy walking around the Himalayas, <laughs> they're like, and so I started looking back, because that's what you do, and then I came back to New York City and tried that on the subway, <laughs> and that doesn't really fly in Manhattan, like people either think that you are going to hit them, or you're going to hit on them. And like, it doesn't really work out so well. So, uh, but here you can look at each other. Um, but I, I really do want to encourage you to, to take some of what this was this evening into your lives and actually take action on it. Um, and 
I'm, I'm leaving my contact information up there for anyone that wants to reach out. I genuinely love feedback. I think that we are lifelong learners. And if you were here and you're like, that guy was totally lame, tell me. But just tell me why. <laughs> like, I don't, I, I don't care if it was like totally boring or whatever. I just want to know how I can, how I can do better. Um, and so, um, before I, uh, so, um, and if anybody wants, uh, every few months, I don't believe in inundating people's uh, emails, but I do um, cull uh, articles that I think are kind of interesting or books that I think um, that I'm reading or, or want to read or quotes that I thought are interesting. So I have sign-ups over there. You're welcome to sign up. If not, no worries. Um, but I do genuinely thank you for your time and your presence here um, and for being you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So did you all enjoy that? You all yes. planned out what your next big thing is? Yeah. <laughs> so let's have a big round of applause for Dr. McCoy. Thank, Thank you very much for coming this Thank evening. You. It was very special to have you here. And if you want to find out more, he has his book in the back, and there'll be an opportunity to speak to him about his book. You can also get a copy and get it signed as well. And we want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, and before we close, Sister Jenna is going to come up and guide us in, in meditation. Um, we want to remind you about a couple upcoming events here at the Meditation Museum. We have um, coming this Sunday. How many of you were raised in a tradition where you, where you read, the, um, read the Gita? Any of you? Where you studied the Gita? So some of you, yeah. And even those of you who didn't, there are wonderful stories in the Gita that really can help us to understand ourselves and to overcome obstacles in our lives. And Brother Kalen is going to be doing a workshop this Sunday at 11.30 at the, our center in McLean, Virginia, on that very topic, overcoming obstacles using the essence of the Gita. And on Tuesday, we have a wonderful workshop that I know that I'm going to come to, and that's uh, the spiritual guide to overcoming emotional eating. <laughs> and this is going to be with, with Sister Cat. And how many of you attended any of Cat Saturday's classes? Really very practical. And uh, so I encourage you all to come to that. And then on Thursday, we have Finding the Balance, um, which is a, a wonderful program on finding balance in your life. And that will be a, a panel discussion. So we hope to see you all there. All the programs offered at the Meditation Museum are offered free of charge. Um, we do appreciate your contributions, though, if you'd like to contribute. There is a box just before you enter the reception area, and there's also one in the reception area as well. And Sister Antonia has asked me to tell you about a few things here. <coughs> so, you know, you've got on the road to finding the answer to what your next big thing is. So the other question you have to answer is, who am I? And to remind you of, of this question, we have all kinds of wonderful things like this hat and this notebook and uh, we have a cup there's one here and they're also in the back as well and how many of you have um, Sister Jenna's um, wonderful CD off to work so this is a wonderful guided meditation CD that you can play on your way to work um, with short meditations that would just help put your day on the right path and I think we played some of this at the beginning, Healing Heart and Soul. This is, this is one of my favorite guided meditation CDs with Carmen Worthington from Australia who does the, does the voiceover on that. A very, very nice CD. Um, tonight's program has been um, recorded for live stream and I think if, if you want to watch it again, it's going to be posted on the website. Is that, that right, Antonia? Okay, great. And so thank you again for coming, and we hope to see you soon. And Sister Jenna, please come join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to tell Ben, thank you so much for offering your gifts to us and for helping us to become better people because I think the more we have these conversations to hit ourselves deeper, 
we then have the power to make that choice, right? So it kind of helps, you know, because on a day-to-day -day basis, we don't get to hear it clearly uh, enough, maybe, that we can make the shift that we need to make. So what I'd like to do, so that you can all get a chance to meet with him and get his book and to have some time and questions with him, is that I'm going to ask this very beautiful spirit to go ahead of me so we can meet you by your book section. And then I'll close everyone off with a little meditation. Is that okay? Yes, thanks, Ben. Thanks again. Big hand for Ben. <laughs> yeah. uh, like those last two claps. <laughs> so the mechanisms of our beings inside the soul, it is calling out to the self, fix me, heal me, make me better, and make me what you know I can be. And so the ability to turn inwards and to be a lot more thoughtful and caring about the way that you're thinking, the way that you are thinking, about the way the scenes unfold in front of you on a day-to-day -day level hel is helping all of us to get some clarity. If I'm not paying attention to the thoughts, then I'll wait for the graphic physical reality to try to show me what was behind it. And I don't want us to keep learning that hard way. So the way in which we look at meditation and spirituality and introspection is to develop the habit to be very mindful of what we are thinking. Example, what are you thinking right now? And whatever you're thinking, you're feeling, and it's sending some sort of an energy to the cells in our body. And if we keep thinking it over and over and over and over and over and over again, it creates the vibrations in our personality. And people are relating to us on the vibrational level more than anything else. We're getting more sensitive and more in tuned with each other. You can smile as much as you want, but if someone's feeling another vibration, that's what they're going to see, not your smile. And then we get confused because we walk away and we go, but I smile with her the whole time. Why does she have an attitude? And we get confused with ourselves too, not understanding why we're not able to master relationships. I remember the story of um, a young woman in a marriage and she felt that she did everything for her mother-in-law to treat her with the utmost of respect, honor, and care. And she did everything for her mother-in-law, but she used to have a lot of waste thoughts about her mother-in-law, but she didn't tell her mother-in-law. So every time her mother-in-law would kind of speak ill of her or not respect her, not value her, what she decoded, but look at how much I do for you. I have taken care of your son, I have done this, I've cleaned the house, I've followed your orders. But what she's not remembering are all the negative thoughts she's had about her mother-in-law. So she doesn't decode that part ever. And a lot of our relationship issues are coming from that factor. That if I can be mindful of what I'm thinking and trust, that these thoughts are really the bedrock of how my life is unfolding, then we take charge of them tonight. And this might be the next best, the next big thing, is to actually be mindful of what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and what I show up in the world with, right? So thank you all for coming out on a wonderful Friday night. And I'm glad we were able to get everyone seated. And um, thank you for coming. And feel free to keep updated on some of these positive thoughts on the Huffington Post. Just Google Sister Jenna, and you'll get some ideas from some very deep thinking discussions and articles or the Pulse for Peace app. Anything we can do to keep adding thoughts that are positive and pure, don't stop that. Don't stop that. And when you bump into a relationship or a situation, that when you try to analyze it, that you've given so much good to it, why is it bringing back something else? 
just start to check a little bit further if there are some thoughts there that are serving that aspect of the relationship that you're not aware of, and then change them. Just replace the thought. You might not be able to stop them, but you can replace them with perhaps a more, what's a truthful thought to have in this situation rather than decoding it based on the negative state that it's come to me with, okay? Just keep playing with that mentally, and you'll enjoy it a lot, okay? So, all right, let's have a nice meditation, shall we? So sit up straight and relax. I'd like to thank the dream team, Evelyn, Sonam, Prabhu, and Prashant. Oh, can I have these two wonderful brothers stand up? Prashant and Prabhu, yay, dream team. <laughs> They came all the way from India for Ben's talk. <laughs> anyway, they're going to be in America, and they're working on three major projects. Their documentary movie called The Time Is Now is being released in eight major cinemas on March 28th. So stay tuned, and we will send you some update. It's called The Time Is Now. And it's all about individuals who have endured genocide, political crisis, or war of some type, and how they've built, they've gone deep inside of themselves to forgive the people that have given them sorrow. So sometimes when you think about somebody cutting you off on 495, is it worth it? <laughs> when you watch that movie, you'll have a different <laughs> spin on that. And they're working on a television show called Soul Search, which... I happen to be in, and they're going to be filming 13 episodes, and they've already done two, and we're on our way to do more, and another special for PBS called Soul Talk, which Ben was in, and we're looking forward to getting that out pretty soon. Brilliant young men, um, please feel free to connect with them too, because there'll be a queue for Ben. Um, talk to them about stuff that's going on. They're looking for network deals. So if anyone knows anyone with Discovery or any of the travel channels, please talk to Prashant or Prabhu to see how they could submit their trailer of the work that they're doing. They're brilliant, brilliant young men. Okay? All right. So we'll do a little meditation now and be a little mindful and focused on the inside. Breathe in deeply. Inhale and exhale. Breathe in again. Inhale and exhale and just relax. Yes, it is true. You are in a space that has been consciously creating meditative feelings. It's called the Meditation Museum. And you, the soul, you're sitting in your body, in the chair, and you're now going to become the master of your own thinking. So put aside all the stories of the day and the activities of the day and just be here. You are sitting here in this room, in this space, in this moment. And slowly and gradually, as you observe your thoughts flowing here and there in your mind, I'd like to visualize your personality completely at peace with itself. How would you look and how would you feel if you were completely at peace with yourself at this moment. The energy of light, the living soul that sits behind your eyes for this 
moment in time. It is you, the soul, that visualizes peace. That you can put aside the things that are disturbing you, the relationships that aren't working, the body that's not working, the financial situations that are not working. At this moment, it works. Because you have control over the energy of peace as your image. Consider your eyes to generate the vibrations of peace. And your lips will spread the vibrations of peace. energy all around you at this moment in your life is an energy of peace, it's an energy of silence, it is I, the immortal, eternal, imperishable, pure, peaceful and powerful being. I sit inside this body completely realized that I, the living soul, I'm an energy of peace. Get used to silence. be truthful, and that is peaceful. As you gently open your eyes and look through your eyes, look through your eyes with the attitude that I am a peaceful being looking through the window of these two eyes. It's my power, it's my truth. And you practice seeing through your eyes as a peaceful human being, someone without internal conflict, just wise. Breathe in deeply and exhale. And what I'd like to invite everyone to do is as we head to the back to meet with Ben, take some time and, sure if it's available, okay, take some time to just be in the space and know that it's a nice little environment and Prashant would like to show everyone the Soul Search trailer of their upcoming TV episodes or season. I remembered once telling them that the story is not the movies that they make, but it's their story. Three young men living in an ashram in the Arrow Valley Mountains in the most arid parts of India for 20 years living in an ashram. And while they're living there, they're developing their skills. Because in the Brahma Kumaris community, we believe in building people, not just sitting on the mountaintop doing nothing. 
So each of us come with a story that we eventually roll into if we're listening quietly. <laughs> okay. few months to ask questions, to seek answers. To me, that's what it's all about. To me, this journey is about coming back home to the center. <coughs> Come along with us. And let's have a wonderful journey together. Why don't you just join us? 